We have here uh, Caroline Atkinson, who uh, is the acting Australian Deputy High Commissioner, which will who who will uh, give us a few words and uh, updates on on the festival. Well, thank you all for coming tonight, um, and thank you for inviting me to be here on this lecture on the Internet of Things. Um, it's great to be here with James Cook University, who are, who are a platinum sponsor, and without whom our Good Science Equals Great Business uh, Festival of Innovation here in Singapore would, it, would not have been possible. Um, but before I start, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people, Dr. Dale Anderson, Dr. Abhishek Bhatti, yep, uh, Dr. Jose Domingos, thanks, um, from JCU Singapore, and Professor Wes Young and Professor Ian Anderson from JCU in Australia. I'd also like to acknowledge the sponsors of our science festival. James Cook University and the Australian National University are our platinum sponsors. Our silver sponsors are RMIT and Stowe UQ and Murdoch, and we also have some gold sponsors, Icon, Curtin, Singapore and Lendlease. Now, just to start, we're really pleased that this event's taking place um, in the third week of the Good Science Equals Great Business um, Festival here in Singapore, which the Australian High Commission is running. Now, what is this Good Science Equals Great Business Festival? You're probably all wondering what the banners are all about. Um, well, it's basically over 40 individual events across the month showcasing the best in Australian science, including the best of science from James Cook University. Um, and we'll bring some high-level visitors here, including Australia's Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, um, Karen Andrews. Now, why are we doing a science festival? Well, we think we've got a great story to tell. Um, we want to showcase the brilliance of Australian science here in Singapore and in the region. And we want to show that our um, universities are world-class and they're doing great things. And we want to showcase our other research institutions. So, for example, CSIRO is amongst the top 1% of um, world scientific institutions. And we also want to talk about some of the great science that Australia has done over the past couple of decades, from Wi-Fi to plastic banknotes. Look, there are so many examples. I don't want to get lost with them. Um, so the second reason that we're doing a science festival um, is to take advantage of the amazing things that are going on here in Singapore. Singapore has great institutions. Its universities are world class and they're doing really excellent research work. Singapore's innovation ecosystem is among the best in the world and um, as of yesterday I think was ranked number five in the world based on the startup um, ecosystem and the investor ecosystem. Um, and also because Singapore has a whole lot of multinationals here and great reach into the region. So the third reason we're holding a science festival is because we think there's a lot of potential for Australia and Singapore to do more together. In 2015, Australia and Singapore signed a comprehensive strategic partnership. Basically, it means we're really good partners. Um, and that's across a whole lot of things from defence to science and innovation is a key part of that. Now, we already do a lot of collaboration. We're really, uh, we're we have a whole lot of um, co-publication and a great collaboration record and, and Australia does with ASEAN as well. So the Singapore-Australia relationship is a good and strong one on the collaboration front, but there's more to come and there's more already happening. Uh, we have an Australian landing pad here in Singapore and Tally, here runs the, Tally from the Australian Trade Commission here runs that. That brings Australian startups to Singapore to take advantage of the Singapore market and the opportunities offered um, by ASEAN. We've had 21 companies through the program, 25 companies through the program, and um, over half of those have actually uh, registered as companies here in Singapore. So there's some real tangible outcomes. So I guess just to finish off, we see there's real significant potential um, to do more collaboration between Australia and Singapore and this science platform, a uh, science festival is a platform for that. That's why we're doing it. So last night, CSIRO launched an ASEAN hub here in Singapore. The Australian National University is opening its Southeast Asia liaison office here in Singapore at the end of the month. And I think the most exciting of all, given where I am, is that JCU will be launching its Tropical Futures Institute um, at the end of the month with your <laughs> Vice-Chancellor. 
So that's great. We already know that the Science Festival is already supporting new connections and new ideas. So we're pretty excited to see what happens next and thanks for, for having me. Uh, dear distinguished uh, uh, guests, uh, colleagues, and dear friends, thank you very much for coming tonight. And uh, my name is Wei Xiang. I had uh, the Internet of Things Engineering Discipline at the James Cook University of Kansas campus. And tonight, I'm going to share with you a journey of three years, uh, Australia's first, and how we establish uh, James Cook University's uh, Internet of Things Engineering program. So it was uh, uh, a journey we started three years ago. The motivation is that if you look at the, the human society we've gone to uh, so far, uh, from Industrial 4.1.0 to uh, Industrial 4.0. So the first one is uh, mechanical, second one is electrical, and third one, which is completed, uh, the so called information and uh, ICT information and, 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 and technology communication. So uh, the third uh, industry innovation uh, has solved the problem for human to communication. Uh, so people like you and me to share the information uh, to communicate. And we're just at the beginning of the so-called very exciting uh, Industrial 4.0. And this will be the first time in human history uh, we're looking at both how humans and the machines interact. And that's so-called so -called cyber physical system. And uh, now it's more commonly known as internal things. Now, the reason why we started this journey 30, uh, three years ago is that uh, if we look at this, uh, uh, this map, so it's a changing uh, workforce uh, uh, phenomenon uh, which is happening right now in Australia. It's said within the next five to 10 years, 40% of the jobs uh, will be gone. Yeah, if you look at the map, you know, those areas marked by reds will be hit very hard by sensing or automation. Like uh, the, the mining region in Western Australia, like agriculture region in Northern uh, uh, Queensland. Yeah. But don't worry about it. The, the jobs, they're, 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 they're missing, yeah, but they're not gone. They're just like new jobs. When the old jobs are gone, the new jobs will be replaced. So from our point of view, yeah, so I was trained as an electrical electronic engineer for, you know, uh, doing my master and a bachelor and a PhD. But in the last five or 10 years, I've been seeing very clearly uh, the industry has made a fundamental change and, and both the industry and people are now embracing the so-called internal things. So we kind of continue teaching the student. Yeah, the same curriculum we've been teaching them for the past uh, 20 years. So internal things started a long time ago as uh, so-called, you know, the wireless sensor networks. So this is what people are thinking about when they're talking about uh, internal things, uh, the sensor devices uh, with comms. Yeah, and if you look at the, 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 the number of devices uh, will be connected, so-called IoT devices, is that by 2020, 50 billion of them will be connected. Yeah, so that's uh, uh, nearly 10 times more the number of the populations on Earth. Now, while on the surface, uh, I think there's a wide misconception uh, and, and, and people tend to think internal things are sensors and sensor communication. But I think that's a, what we call a tip of iceberg. So on the surface, so you might see the sensors, sensor communication. But what is more important is what's underneath the water. So that's where the things like data analytics, uh, automation, uh, data integration, uh, machine learning. So. Uh, the internet of things these days, it's dramatically different from what was it uh, was, you know, five or ten years ago. So, uh, 2017, in uh, February, I was invited by uh, Engineer Australia to write uh, experts' opinion on uh, IoT for smart cities. And at that time, I think that uh, uh, everyone's talking about, you know, the uh, smart cities as the cities are transforming itself uh, using IoT technology. And that's the first time I propose, I advocate uh, uh, a conception for uh, the IoT. So I believe uh, IoT is an ecosystem, is a data-driven uh, technology divided into uh, three layers. The first layer, so IoT is all about data-driven. So first layer is what I call data collection. So that's why, uh, that's where we're using various, uh, you know, all the different types of sensors collecting the data. 
So for almost every single uh, physical in, uh, parameter, there's al always a corresponding sensor, uh, either cheap or expensive to collect the data. And the second layer is what I call data communication. So sensors are usually deployed in the field. Yeah, and, but we need to, to process the, dead, uh, the data. We need to uh, transmit, transport the data where it was first collected to where the data will be processed. Uh, used to be so-called cloud computing. So uh, data will be processed up in the cloud. But now the latest trends on the IoT data processing is pushing data processing to the edge. So you probably have come, uh, come across the terminology called the edge computing. Yeah, edge artificial intelligence, et cetera. So the top layer is what call, I call the data analytics. So whether it's a, it's a small data processing or big data processing, this is actually the most valuable part of IoT ecosystem. <coughs> if I have to uh, put down a number, I would think it's 20% for data collection, 20% for data communication, and 20% for uh, the data process. sorry, 60% of uh, data processing. So people, a lot of people say, you know, data is king. Yeah, so you probably heard a lot of them. Yeah, data is king. Yeah, and, but I, I, I tend to think data is useless. Data is absolutely useless unless we turn data into insights, information, and knowledge. Because what essentially what data is, is a, is a very long string of zero and ones in the computing world. I don't think that's in anybody's interest to read that very long string of the, uh, zero and ones. So, uh, uh, so that's my, my, my point of view. It's a, uh, it's a three-layer data-driven technology. So I think the beauty, what I feel most excited about IoT is that it's, it's a platform technology. So it fits in all, uh, every single vertical industry. If you like working in the in manufacturing, there's a smart manufacturing based on industrial 4.0 revolution going on. If you like a, a healthcare, a smart healthcare, variable devices uh, are collecting the data 24 seven. And if you like it, vehicles, you know, working in the automobile industry, their cars you know, drive themselves, self-driving. Yeah, so almost for every single discipline, industry, you can think of, there's always a role for IoT to play. And, and it's not that far away from us than uh, some of you guys might think. Uh, this was a recent interview I did with uh, a local newspaper, a Ken's Post. So it, it's only three or three, four weeks ago. So there's members of Publix in Cairns that are proposing self-driving cars to reduce the traffic jam uh, in the Corinna Ranch. So Corinna Ranch is a ranch connecting Cairns and the Tablelands. So the members of Publix are thinking, well, we can use uh, self-driving cars to reduce the traffic jam. And I think that's, that's very likely and, and it's going to happen within the next five years and top 10, I think, that, yeah, at the most. And 5G, yeah, well, everyone is using 4G at the moment, and 5G is coming up. And, uh, and 5G is completely different from the, all the previous of 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G. And because 5G for the first time will bring the machine connectivity into that map. Now, so from an educator point for you, yeah, if we look at uh, our electrical engineering curriculum, and we've been teaching that for last nearly 20 years, it hasn't been changed much. And myself, including myself, I was taught, uh, you know, I was educated as an electrical engineer. And I found uh, the stuff, the curriculum I was taught, you know, more than 20 years ago, it's very similar to what has been taught, you know, today's electrical engineering. But industry doesn't think this way. Yeah, so industry is all embracing uh, internal things, uh, industry 4.0. This morning, I was at the technology uh, innovation conference uh, in the uh, Marina Sands. And people have been asking that our internal things is one of the most uh, uh, buzzy uh, words I've been hearing all the morning. Yeah, the, actually the opening uh, keynote speech was from ARM. Um, yeah, it's about IoT connected word. So from educative point of view, I think it's uh, three years ago we decided, you know, it's, it's, it, you know enough is enough. Uh, we need to educate our kids, our students, so that they, you know, the knowledge they have you know, they can bring them on and, 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 and by the time they graduate, they can embrace uh, an entire new world. So this is why we decided to introducing uh, Australia's first international engineering degree. 
So the feature we're very proud of, yeah. So we, we started journey 2016 uh, early, and uh, it took me all nearly one one year leading a team of uh, four people, and we get uh, uh, the accreditation from Engineers Australia uh, in November 2016. So now we're officially the first, the only international engineering provider in Australia, and uh, we are very uh, proud. The unique feature of our IoT uh, degree is a so-called three-in-one. So we teach a student the traditional uh, the hardware skills, and also we teach a student uh, the IT, the so-called software skills, programming. Uh, more importantly, and we teach a student uh, the so-called data analytics and machine learning type of skills. Because eventually, like I said, you know, the, uh, the, the most valuable part of the IoT of uh, that ecosystem is uh, data uh, processing. So uh, if you want to look at the details of the IoT curriculum, this is uh, 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 the detailed course. And, 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 and this is a sort of, uh, uh, we combine the curriculum from uh, both IT and electrical engineering, but we add a very unique feature into uh, the data part. And uh, starting from 2016, yeah, JSU almost uh, invested a million dollars in terms of infrastructure. So we put a lot of real money into, uh, into this degree. So we built two labs. The first one is called IoT Innovation Lab. And that's a very uh, cutting edge, yeah, state of art. Uh, the interactive uh, lab, that's where students are doing the practicals. And also we build the IoT Development Lab. And that's our postgraduate student uh, working with the industry partners and hands-on yeah, projects. And we're also very pleased that I think uh, two weeks ago, uh, uh, the new Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, came up to Cairns and to announce this $30 million facility, Cairns uh, Innovation Center. And the International Engineering in Cairns will be the anchor tenant. So we'll occupy around 70 to 80% of the space. So I and think that's, uh, that's going to be a game changer. So what we call, this is a, uh, this is a, a, a so-called Kansas Innovation Center. We're very, very excited uh, because uh, it's a so-called one-stop shop. And that's where the student uh, do all the teaching, uh, learning uh, in one place. And also the working on the, on the, on the projects, uh, industry-sponsored projects. And more importantly, there's some space reserved uh, for industries. So the student will have the opportunity to work with the industry people uh, side by side and solving real world problems. And by the time they graduate, we're thinking, you know, we have some you know, incubation space. So some of the kids, what we call generation YZ, they might not no, no longer like the, the parent generation. They don't like to work for uh, someone else. They like to work, work for themselves. And that's what they can do, uh, you know, uh, live their dream. Yeah, so we can nurture them, incubate them. And speaking of the internal things, you can't do away with the industry partnerships. So we're building an array of industry partnerships. So because we want to, you know, so it's very applied technology. It's not just the, uh, you know, equations, formulas on paper. So uh, over the last few years, we're building an array of uh, industry partners, uh, uh, like a Kansas City Council, Optus. I think Optus has a, you know, it's a, it's a parent company is right here. Yes, Intel. Uh, Ergon HE Huawei and, 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 and Queensland government, uh, etc. Uh, last year we launched uh, Australia's first narrowband uh, IoT uh, the lab. This is the first lab in Australia. Yeah. And narrowband IoT is the cutting edge, the latest uh, uh, standard, international standard on uh, IoT. And also we have it, yeah, with the Huawei, there's a, uh, Huawei is, a, is, a, is a collaborating with the federal government on a so-called Seeds for Future program is, as part of the new Colombo program. So sending, you know, each year they're sending uh, five or six JSU uh, kids uh, to the China for three weeks. So that's where they let the students into the latest lab uh, in Huawei. And this picture shows uh, uh, December, sometime uh, December last year. So Telstra sent a 20, 20 uh, uh, person uh, delegation to visit Shenzhen and uh, are led by the Telstra CEO and chairman. And also uh, uh, one student, you're yeah, sitting next to that, that Wilson. So he was chosen as a represent, re representative uh, student of Australia to uh, receive the uh, Telstra uh, and Huawei people. All right, so why a uh, narrowband IoT? So uh, some people might be confused. We've been talking about broadband all the time. Yeah, people, yeah, 
I want broadband yeah, as fast as possible. And that is true for human communication because people like you and me, we watch video, all right? we listen to the mu music online, but mach machines are entirely different. They don't have emotion. They don't watch video. Yeah, they don't listen to music. All they want to send is information to tell that, for example, your cars are driving themselves. All they want, you know, the car, your car, whenever you brake, you send the signal to warning, yeah, the car's behind you. Yeah, that's all they do. So the narrower the bandwidth, the better. Because narrower the bandwidth means uh, the more, the higher power efficiency and longer the range you can transmit. So with narrowband IoT, is the international, latest international standard, the only one in the world uh, endorsed by 3GPP, it's the same as, as 4G we're using. So it features like a 10 years, after 10 years battery life and very secure. Yeah, IoT privacy and security is one of the most con concerned, but narrowband IoT using license uh, spectrum. It's very secure and it's very cheap. It's only $5 per module uh, in terms of comms units. And this is the reason, uh, this is because all the industry drives uh, like Ericsson, uh, Cisco, Qualcomm, all united behind this uh, uh, narrowband IoT. And IoT, uh, narrowband IoT is also uh, very, very suitable for smart city. Yeah, so, and, and we would imagine, you know, out there, there's a lot of the, you know, devices, you know, because a narrowband IoT is very, uh, is an international standard. So uh, we would imagine vision, you know, all sorts of different manufacturers making uh, MB IoT uh, devices. So how do we make sure they're talking to each other, they're compatible with each other? Because if they don't, we'll get into big trouble. Imagine if you, uh, the sensors installed on your car can't talk to the sensors, uh, uh, you know, on the roadside and you will be getting into a big trouble. So, uh, so compatibility, it's very important. And this is the reason why last year, uh, December last year, we teamed up with uh, uh, NLX Test Lab. It's an uh, NATAC certified lab in Australia, based in Melbourne, uh, to build uh, MBIoT testing and the certificate center. As far as more wealth, uh, this is the third one in the world. Uh, the first one, GCF in Europe, a second one is a, is a, is a, is a an, uh, tire lab in, in China, and where this is a third one. So we, uh, our hope, our objective is that in the future, every single uh, narrowband IoT devices, uh, hopefully, yeah, yeah, to be sold in Australian market, get a stamp, say, from JSU. Yeah, this is com com compatible. You're okay. You're good to go in Australian market. Yeah, the lab, yeah, so the IoT discipline, since we established, we have checked uh, uh, quite a few uh, uh, high-level visits. Uh, what is shown here is uh, two months ago, the, uh, the Federal Minister of Resources in Northern Australia, uh, Minister Canavan. Yeah, so Canavan is very interesting in, uh, in hearing, yeah, so country's first IoT program is actually running from far north Queensland, it's not from Melbourne, not from Sydney. So. He was quite surprised and he wanted to have a look. And, and this is where we show them all the, all the student projects we're working on the, uh, smart agriculture. As a matter of fact, I think uh, uh, back in 2000, early 2017, the uh, Singapore High Commission uh, in Australia came up to Cairns to look at uh, our lab as well. So Singapore is known as a smart city state. And I lived in Singapore for six months back in 2008. So I was doing my sabbatical with uh, uh, Nanyang Technology University. That's when the ERP yeah, was first, uh, wasn't, yeah, it was in introduced not long ago. So ERP was, I mean, today's, uh, it's, it's a part of the IoT. Uh, sorry, it's part of the smart uh, uh, city. Uh, and uh, congratulations uh, on, on Singapore. I think Singapore uh, started the smart city concept a long time ago, and, and, and Singaporeans are doing very well in smart city. So uh, if you look at the smart city, I think uh, everyone talking about smart city can't do away. Yeah, you can't not talking about IoT because IoT is underlying the, the digital infrastructure for, for smart city. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a platform. So uh, you have a, at the bottom layer, you have the sensor collecting all the data. And, and then the data will be sent to a so-called data center. So essentially, the data center is a brain. It's what we call city brain. So that connecting to all the various uh, uh, the council utilizations so like smart parking, uh, uh, garbage collection, and, 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 uh, and public transportation, uh, smart uh, street pole, uh, you name it. 
So why is the councils or, or cities having those information that provide you know, uh, a critical decision making information for them to run the city much more efficiently? And this is what the, uh, the smart board, yeah, so next version of smart city, yeah. So what we'll be looking like is you know, every single city in the world, or uh, yeah, on the planet will be you know wound up with hundreds of thousands of census everywhere we go. Uh, the census are reporting all the all kinds of information. All right, then uh, uh, at uh, James Cook University in Cairns campus, so, you know, because we have a cohort of students, yeah, around uh, 80 students. So we are finding them. We're doing a lot of the project we're doing is a, a industry uh, sponsor project. So this is one of them. Everybody knows we are at the doorstep of the Great Bear Reef. So it's natural to thinking to using uh, internal things, uh, the technology to helping uh, protecting our reefs. So this is one of the PhD students, yeah, for a so-called internet of underwater things and, and also the so-called big ocean data. So that's a very challenging uh, project because the sensor communication in ocean environments are very harsh, very harsh. But that's one of the most exciting area, I believe, for the IoT and a lot of the gross, gross area, yeah. And as uh, uh, the Great Bear, Bear Reef, you know, has become, you know, as an uh, Australian national icon, so the government is putting a lot of money in there, and I do think the internet things has a very, very big role to, to play. Another uh, a project we're working uh, with the city council, this is funded by uh, Australian government smart cities and the suburb pro program. So this is looking at uh, using IoT technology uh, for monitoring uh, the, the GBR, Great Bear Reef, the water quality. Uh, as far as I'm well, uh, this is the first one in Australia to looking at the urban catchment area, how the water from urban area is going to affect the water quality in GBR. There's some other work has been done, a lot of work has been done, but primarily they've focused on uh, the rural area like, uh, like Johnson, uh, Tully, those catchment area. But this is the first one uh, right in the middle of the city uh, in Cairns. So what we did is uh, we're building a real-time IoT monitoring system using sensors, different sensors, uh, to collecting data in a, in, a, in a catchment area in the city, right in the middle of the city, called salt water, uh, quick water catchment area. And we push up the data to the clouds. And then the cloud has an artificial intelligent engine, uh, the brain, and that's where the, uh, the data will be processed. And that's where we, we, we implement so-called uh, predictive uh, analytics and yeah, healthcare, you name it. Yeah, so there's a lot of the, uh, interesting going on with, the, with the healthcare. As, as uh, you know, in Australia, we are a lot of people living in, the, in a remote area, regional area. So by using uh, narrowband IoT uh, technology, so the sensors become small enough so people can wear them 24 seven. So that's where the collecting data, like the blood pressure, uh, oxygen, and the data is the real time connected to the clouds, and, and it works on the 24 seven. So this is like you have a doctor watching on you 24-7. And if anything goes wrong, you will get a, you know, a message or, or whatever and to remind you uh, to look after yourself. And I think this is good things for, uh, for ordinary yeah, to, to public, probably not so good news for, for uh, the medical students. Yeah, so a lot of the doctors are worrying about you know, their jobs, landscape will be changing, yeah. And this is another, uh, uh, a PhD student uh, working on the using IoT for a medical space utilization. So the student is working at the Townsville Hospital. Uh, some of the space, a medical space, is highly valuable. So how do you monitor those space utilization? And how do you best maximize your, your, your efficiency? And that's where you can use you know, various IoT sensors monitoring how much the space is utilized. And, and then you can predict uh, uh, whether you need to, uh, 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 you know, uh, somehow improve the space ut utilization. It's quite exciting project. And Cairns Marine, yeah, Cairns Marine. I'm not sure how, how uh, if have you heard about the Cairns Marine, but this is a local company based in Cairns, but they are the largest and leading supplier of marine life. So they've done they've done a lot of aquariums. Uh, they did the latest one in Cairns, the Cairns Macquarian. They did the largest Macquarian uh, in the world. That's in Dubai, Atlantis. The hotel, if you've been to the lobby, uh, and they did that. And also they did one uh, uh, the, with Hong Kong Marine Park. So they come up to, to us a couple months ago, 
and telling me they've got this nice facility, two vessels going out to the sea and collecting data for the last 10 years. Every day. Yeah, so log the data and put in, 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 in a very, very large Excel sheet. Now it comes to a stage, they, they're wondering what they can do about the data, how they can make the best use of the data. And so what they want us is for uh, their uh, husbandry uh, platform, you know, it's uh, uh, the largest one in case. So how, first, how do we visualize data so they can make sense out of the data? And this is based on, the uh, first step is based on historic data, you know, past 10 years. The second stage, they want to build up uh, a farm, yeah, so uh, a coral reef farm up in the tablelands. So that's where they want to build a real-time IoT monitoring system. And so uh, now the data now is currently collected by, uh, by census and manually logged by human, uh, sorry, manually logged by, by the staff. But they want to do away with the approach. They want everything automated. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting uh, project. We're going through the, uh, the federal government's innovation connection uh, program. And big mates. Yeah, sorry, we just got too many industry uh, the projects. BigMate is, 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 is a company based in, Mel uh, sorry, based in Brisbane, and they are a specialized in internet of so-called asset tracking. So using IoT technology, uh, checking the ver uh, uh, variable asset. So they come into us, they want to build a partnership with us. Uh, so it's, they bring with, uh, to us a very interesting uh, project. It's Cholis. Yeah, I think the Cholis in, in Australia is probably a different thing in, than in Singapore, because I lived in Singapore uh, for, for six months. Uh, in Australia, we use this kind of trolleys, so you can take the trolleys away outside of the, uh, the complex. Yeah, so the problem is that it's convenient for uh, the clients, the, the customers, but the problem is that, that, that this is a like, huge cost for the supermarket like a Coles and a Woolworths because they have to send a lot of people to collecting the, 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 the trolleys. Sometimes the trolleys they end up with uh, very far away places, uh, you know, in the middle of the <laughs> suburb. So the idea is to install a narrowband IoT sensor uh, on each one of those trolleys. Only cost you like a very, like a 10, you know, 20 bucks. But what they want is real-time monitoring where, where the trolleys are. And, and the original motivation, our objective is just to reduce cost, you know, of replacing the trolleys. But then once they start this project, they find out that there's a lot of more valuable information coming out of the data because, and once you analyze data, you look at it as a location information, you suddenly realize, wow, this is uh, some area that you should be targeting your advertisement more intensively than other areas. Yeah, if you know what I mean. So it turns out, you know, original idea is reduce the cost on trolley. It turns out to be a, a, a kind of a marketing, you know, decision tools. So very, yeah, very interesting project. Yeah, uh, I think I'm running out of time. So uh, I'll just make, uh, yeah. So uh, overall take take home message is that uh, we we are very proud. Uh, we started journey three years ago, built Australia's first uh, IoT program created by Engineer Australia. And we're very proud. We build a lot of the uh, strong uh, industry partnerships. And thirdly, we have a lot of the projects we're working with the industry uh, so that uh, give our students opportunity to solve real world problems. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I thought what I'd do tonight to make it a little bit interesting, especially seeing as Wei's covered all the good stuff, that I'd give you some some notes from the field, really, some, um, some war stories from practically trying to do this kind of work. And, and the first one I'll talk about is Wei talked about the journey of JCU to develop this Australian First Internet of Things degree. I'll tell you a little backstory, which is sort of instructive. So the, the Dean of Science at the time walked proudly into my office and said, I'm, we're going to start engineering in Cairns. And I said, that's good. I said, what are you going to do? And he said, we're going to do plant engineering. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, it's all about how plants work you know, manufacturing. I said, but they don't do anything like that in Cairns. And he said, well, what did you do then? And I said, well, I'd do the Internet of Things. And he said, what's that? And I explained it. And he got very angry and walked out. And about two hours later, he walked back and said, tell me more about this. <laughs> and about two weeks later, he walked in very proudly and said, well, we're going to do it. It's approved. I couldn't believe it. So I said it was the first good decision he'd ever made. And he left shortly afterwards. But 
it's been a great decision and, and I think you'll see why, why I'm interested in it. So the first principle I want to talk to you tonight is, is this very important maximum. That is, humans in the short term overestimate change. We always overestimate the impact. Every new thing you'll hear and read about, it's going to create, there's be a great calamity or be a great utopia coming. But it, it never happens like that. But in the long run, something big happens. Something much bigger impacts the system. So in the short term, humans overestimate change. And in the long term, we underestimate change. So we tend to think about the future linearly, but, but technology evolves in, in peaks and hills. And probably with the IoT, I reckon we're down here. We're overestimating the value right now. And it'll go quiescent for a little while. And then it'll come back and it will really, really change us. And, and I think those, that cycle's compressing very soon. It'll be very different. So in a way to illustrate that, when I, I got first interested in this area in the early 2000s, very early 2000s. And this was a graph that came out in 2005 from uh, Stanford uh, Research Institute Consulting. And it was their roadmap to what they call the Internet of Things. In fact, then they called it cyber physical systems, but I'm calling it Internet of Things. And they said we'd have RFID tags for facilitating inventory and loss prevention, you know, the RFID tags that were everywhere. And indeed we did. And then in sort of late, uh, late 2010s, uh, surveillance, security, healthcare, transport would all be using these techniques to help supply chain management, which they were. And then it would move into the vertical markets. We could locate people and everyday objects and everyone's got a mobile phone and of course everyone knows they're intimately tracked now and cars are tracked, way talked about big mate. This is all happening now. And they predicted that, you know, 10 years on, which they have. And then this teleoperation and telepresence, the ability to monitor and control distant objects. That's the Internet of Things. And, you know, 2018, we're there. So they actually could really, they had the foresight and the accuracy to predict what's happening now. And I won't tell you what's on the rest of that graph till a bit later on. Um, so this is my origin story of the IoT. This is probably a sunset, but it, it should be a sunrise. It looks quite nice um, out there. That's on the Barrier Reef. It's about 100 kilometres from shore. And there's a tower, and I'll explain why. So I've gone all the way back to 2000, and I think these slides date from 2005. And I've got a little trap, four, four or five of them to show you what I was try trying to do in 2005. Remote instrumentation and sensor networks on the Great Barrier Reef. What's that all about? Well, in 1998 and in 2002, there were two big coral bleaching episodes. People have heard about coral bleaching on the Barrier Reef re recently. It's all dying away. There are also two big, not as, not as big as the ones that have been in the last two years, but there were the first two big bleaching episodes. Everyone was scared. Now, the, the Barrier Reef is really big. It's really, really big. It's, you know, 350,000 square kilometres. It's 2,800 kilometres long. And we had like four or five monitoring points. And it seemed crazy to me as an IT person that you think you would know what's going on from two or three points on something that big. So I thought, that's all right, I'll fix that. What could possibly go wrong? So that was 2003 I did that, had that idea. And I talked about sensor networks, that one day the IT will be connecting the cyber world with the physical world. And in the 1980s, PCs put computers on your desks. In the 1990s, we had the internet. And so I said, well, it's the 2000s. Now we're going to have everything connected everywhere, and we'll know what's happening on the reef in real time. And that was a, that was a report to the National Science Foundation US in 2005. That's a bit, so that was the 2005 slides. So this is coral bleaching, you know, their, their photos, I actually took this one during that 2002 event. And the question is why, we know it's to do with hot water, we've got to understand how the temperature of the water, so surely that's not hard to measure, I thought, across that reef. So um, the question was how did, agri there, there were also questions about whether agricultural runoff, whether fertilisers running off from farms were, as, were also negatively impacting the reef. And uh, if I look at a reef here, You've got these areas here of all of agriculture, whether it's beef here, or sugar, or little bits of cotton, or urban environments. All these things generate runoff. So whether it's cows walking through fields, creating sediment erosion, or farmers putting urea on their cane, and that cane, uh, and that just flowing into the reef system, and whether that rolls out onto the reef and affects it, whether it's temperature, all these things on this huge, sparse and unmonitored system, no one knew. And I thought, well, surely we can do that. What, 
you know, how hard can that be? So I proposed this idea in about 2003, which was probably ahead of its time, that we'd have microwave connections from the reef to the shore, from those towers that you saw. And around each reef we'd have this, like a Wi-Fi field, monitoring, talking to sensors. And the boys would have sort of coastal radar, we'd do video, we'd, we'd connect that to the internet, we'd have big computers and historic data, and we'd be able to research it, we'd be able to share it, and particularly we'd be able to educate people, and we'd be able to change people's attitudes, because we'd have access to the data in real time. So that, that was my 2003 vision, and I, I went around to everyone talking about this. I was very excited. I spoke to prime ministers and premiers, and no one got it. They all thought I was mad. So I did what anyone would do. I simply stole some money. And, and um, they don't let me near public money often, you can tell. So I, I had a model here. We'd take sensors, and we'd aggregate the data, and we'd transport it, and we'd quality control it, and ingest it, and disseminate it. And that's very, very much what IoT does now. And uh, so we'd have a microwave link. So the first problem was we needed to send this microwave from this tower 90 kilometres back to shore. The problem is that the curvature of the Earth gets in the way. The problem is to do that you need, the curvature of the Earth is about one metre per kilometre. So we'd need these towers 90 plus kilometres high. But I couldn't get a 90 kilometre tower, 90 metre tower on the reef. It was just too expensive. I couldn't steal that much money. So I read a paper by a physicist who long retired from James Cook. He talked about bending microwaves through tropical humidity ducts. And this was like this is science fiction stuff, but you know, we tried it. And it worked. And so we managed to put a whole microwave system. This was big, chunky kit. It was like 19-inch rack-mounted kit, which used huge amounts of power. We stuck it on the reef, we bent the microwaves, and we could get video from the reef. It was amazing. And there's, there's my assistant, Cameron, there's the birds, there's our video camera. And this is all this infrastructure to drive a, a small connection now that you can have from your mobile phone. But that was as good as we could do at the time, and it cost a lot of money. But we had a problem. Can you see the problem? It's the only thing sitting in the middle of the motion, ocean for 90 kilometres. And there's a lot of birds and they want to rest on something and they rest on the bloody tower. And <laughs> the problem with that, the problem with that is that the birds drop guano. There are solar panels. <laughs> After three days. <laughs> there's nothing I could do to work out how to get rid of these bloody birds guanoing the solar panel. So it worked perfectly for three days. And there's no, so we, we, did, we tried everything. We had virtually had uh, pumps there driving almost irrigation, irrigating the thing, but there's just there's nothing you could do to stop it. And in fact, that actually in the end ruined the experiment. I was, I was actually in, um, giving a plenary in India about this, and I was asking people, what, what, what could we possibly do? And it came to me suddenly what we needed out there. It was cats. I needed cats. <laughs> I needed cats out there. And so I went back and talked to the ethics committee about it. And they didn't let me put cats there. So that, that kind of concluded. That. And that was, bit, that, so I couldn't, I was defeated by the birds. Put a scarecrow? Uh, I tried that. <laughs> it's really, really hard problem. So the problem was, that it was the right idea, but the technology wasn't up to it. I couldn't, I needed too much power to do what I needed to do. But we had a crack. So let's come back to today. That's, that's like a bit of history about, this isn't as easy as you think, and you'll see lots of people telling you how wonderfully easy it is, and, and you'll click your fingers, and it's not like that. So, so I was kept away from public money and these kinds of problems for a little while, but eventually people forgot, and, and I was allowed to go back again. And so I was actually working with the, the Townsville City Council, and they had a system called Taggle. It was to read the water meters. It was a smart city application. They wanted to read people's water meters to, to uh, indicate to them when they were overusing water. Fine and get rid of jobs of the people who read the water meters, of course, of course. Um, and so they, the Sydney company built this system called Taggle, and it's a very low power one-way transmission system for just a small amount of data, 15 and a half bytes. Everyone talks about megabytes and gigabytes, 15 and a half bytes per transmission, which implies a, and imposes on you a lot of discipline about how you do your work, because you don't have much to deal with. But it's very power efficient, and it can transmit up to 25 kilometers, and each base station can handle about 30,000 of those. 
So we could put as many sensors as we liked out as long as we didn't do much with them. So, which is what, what we did. And so we went away and learned how to make electronics because I didn't have the background weighted. And we built these water quality monitoring boys for the city council and we threw them out. And we then used 3G to get the data back to servers and then we made apps. And we could indeed do this remote water quality monitoring. And our goal was that it had to be cheap. It had to be under $500. And the reason for that was that in local government, people don't have a lot of money. And in fact, today at the, at the expo I was at, I heard a voice from behind me call, calling out, excuse me, sir, and I turned around, it was a, a friend of mine, Polani, from the University of Melbourne. I haven't seen him for 10 years. And he, he's kind of the father of this in Australia. And he's been out of the country for a long time. And he was a distinguished grey gentleman, Indian gentleman now, not like me. And um, he, um, he reminded me of this work we did. And he's got a new term. He calls it frugal IoT. IoT at low cost. We've got to pull the cost out to make it deployable. So we, could, we, managed, we had to build these things at extremely low cost, which was great discipline for us. And we were, therefore had to build low cost sensors. We couldn't use commercial sensors. So we had to build our own. And this was great fun. So these are some of our um, water quality sensors based on washing machine parts that we re-engineered. And so we could build these really actually almost, um, well, in fact, I think they are probably uh, the best turbidity sensor in the world. And we can build that for about $30. But it's all built up on our own. It's all based on the fact that so much cheap electronics is available through mobile phones. And so these are our boys and we can simply put them in a rowboat, row them out, throw them over the side. They cost 200 bucks. I don't care if a shark eats the line and they float away. They've got a GPS. They'll send me a, a data point periodically. Um, and they work really well till they get biofouled and there's too much biofouling. And we do have a solution to that now, but I won't tell you because I think it's one of my better ideas. And so the, the City Council um, do use that to monitor things like fish kills and so forth. And there's a lot of very clever things you can do if you have data. And, and I, I'm not going to talk much more about that now. But I will talk about this. I'll sort of pivot and I'll come back to this. Talk about the university's research stations and observatories. So it's got three sort of research stations. Uh, one in the outback uh, in a beef cattle property. One in the rainforest and the other on Orpheus Island, which is, a, which is an island research station. And um, I've been asked, some of these pro locations have also run a number of Internet of Things projects over the years, and I'll just describe a few of them to you. So the first is Orpheus Island, this classroom on the reef, we call it. And you can see we, we have curriculum for students, they have real-time sensors, uh, we've got underwater cameras, and they can count fish and do all sorts of stuff. And they don't even know the, the interacting with the Internet of Things. And that's the great thing about it. It's just new data and new approaches for them to do this work. And they think they're mucking around on the reef. And in fact, they're using this technology without even knowing it now. And that's great. And so this is now tripling down to, to high school classrooms. So you can go and Google that out, classroom on the reef. And you can see that's actually working. And it's supported by the Queensland Education Department. We've got a curriculum for that work, which is now part of the Australian high school curriculum. So that's now making IoT and just making it a tool for education. And we're also doing it up in our Daintree Rainforest Observatory. It's, we call it Classroom in the Rainforest. So this is the Daintree Rainforest here, up north of Cairns, adjacent to the Barrier Reef. It's the only place in the world where rainforest meets the reef. Um, you can see where it is in Australia. And it's quite unusual. We've got a research station up there with, with, a, with a construction crane, the sort of thing you'd see in the middle of Singapore on a skyscraper. We've got one in the rainforest, so we can sample the, the things in the rainforest up in the canopy. We don't have to climb the trees. So there's the construction crane right in the middle of the rainforest. And there's no really internet up in the Daintree. It's too hilly. Satellites don't work well. It's great, because if you want to sleep, you can climb the tower and no one's going to interrupt you, your rest. And I've done that a couple of times. It's quite relaxing. You can see whales and all sorts uh, in, over. And um, we've got quite a lot of infrastructure here. So we've got a hectare plot underneath the, rain, underneath the crane. We've got over 600 sensors monitoring those things. We've got soil moisture sensors. We can count leaves. We've got these vines running up the tree. <laughs> And these are the sensors that I had high school students build for me, monitoring temperature and humidity and light every metre as you go up the tree. And we've got um, some dozens of trees wired up with that now. We've got these devices measuring the sap flow up the trees. 
These devices measure the girth of the tree and during the day as the plant absorbs water it expands and at night it contracts and we can measure the growth rate of the tree in real time. We can even monitor um, the wildlife. This is the, the crane and this eagle actually um, built a nest at the end of the crane. And we thought it was pretty fun, everyone wanted to talk about it, so we actually put a camera up there. And, um, and you'll see that in a minute. So what we had is, effectively, um, we had an internet of trees, not an internet of things. We had over 600 of these sensor data points underneath here. So we then had a big data problem from the rainforest. We had to ingest that, store it, uh, QA it, do all this, this fancy stuff to create the nice graphs and charts and even a Minecraft-like interface for kids. But the problem was there was no internet there, so we had, a, had to have a sneaker network. Every week a hard disk would come back with all the data and we'd plug it in. And so everything was real time, one week delayed. Um, but it works quite well. And so we had a lot of people, and we still do have people looking at, at the exploits of our eagle there. And we, we pulled a still out of this one year and entered it into a National Geographic photographic competition. It actually won, which was quite funny, because no one really took the photograph, but <laughs> it was a great location. And this, this one over here is a, um, is a white striped possum. And we have a, a camera in its nest, and if you see her having a yawn there and her very long tongue. Um, these are just little devices, but they're, they're very good for engaging the public. So I'm going to just continue on and talk a little bit now about beef. So this is our, our remote cattle station called um, Fletcher View. It's about 2,000 hectares. And it's about, um, about 200 kilometres from Townsville. It's very close to where my father actually grew up. So my father grew up in the beef industry, so I've got kind of a soft spot for beef, I don't know why. Beef's a big industry for Australia and the state of Queensland here. Uh, it's worth, I don't know, five and a half billion dollars to the state of Queensland beef exports. It's, it's probably our third largest export behind um, coal and gas. And you can see our cows here with their special collars. These are some of the world's first internet connected cows. Um, that's effective, that, was, that is a very early generation Fitbit for cows. That is generating two million data points a month. It's got a GPS measuring every 30 seconds the position of the cow. Um, and a whole lot of other stuff too. And that's a great device, but that's not frugal. That's like, that's like $1,000. Um, so we need a cheaper Fitbit for cows and we've been asked by commercial partners to help build that and that's what we're doing. So beef, beef in Australia is, um, is big business, but it's big business in parts of the country where there's almost no one. You know, Northern Territory and Western Queensland, there's almost no one living there. There's just a few tens of thousands of people for about, up here, about 20 million cows. So there's a lot of cows and not a lot of people and there's not a lot of infrastructure. So, so that, that's the situation, that industry. And so we embarked on a long-term project called the Digital Homestead. It was very applied. Actually, when we started, we had very great dreams of doing, doing satellite monitoring and doing all sorts of great high-tech science in the bush. But we were very quickly told that that's not what people wanted. People actually wanted simple things. They had much simpler problems to, that needed resolving before they needed to know the, the, the condition of pastures by satellite every day. So we focused in the end on the technology that would help people's day-to-day -day lives. So we looked at the social as well as the technology. We needed to be open and integrative and we had to have low-cost technology. I'm gonna take that out and I'm gonna put frugal. It has to be frugal. Because when we started this project, our beef producers were doing all this work and earning $1.30 per kilogram live weight per animal. So they're 400, dollar cow they might sell for five hundred dollars it's a lot of work for five hundred dollars and if you went along and said oh we've got these great things we can do and it's only five hundred dollars per cow they kind of don't talk to you again and it had to work in this tough tough environment so in the end we came down to just animal weights because it's valuable and um, real-time data and also provenance about the animal and also just general stuff about the farm, you know, whether the gate's open or whether the boar's got water. Simple stuff, but it matters. So this walkover weighing platform is based on commercial technology. Um, animals walk over the weigh bridge. The weight's measured. They're, they've got an RFID tag in their ear, so we know their, their identity, that we know their weight. 
we know if the animal's putting on weight or losing weight and you get back the data in real time. And so these were the kind of interfaces and we call that the digital homestead. And we actually co-designed all the software with the producers. So it was a productivity platform and it actually increased profit by about $35 per head. Now that was enough of profit to make it worthwhile. But the problem was this kit was still $10,000 worth of kit. So we went on to AliExpress and we bought the load cells ourselves and so it's only $500 now. So it's frugal. And unfortunately some more people who are building technology are out of jobs because we've published the plans for this and plenty of people are making it themselves. And it's great. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but it is upsetting. But, but, but there's, the, you know, there's the proof of data. If, if you sell your animals too early when they're too low in weight, you lose, in this case, about 12 cents per kilo. It doesn't sound much, but that's, that's your profit. And as you move up, you, you get more per animal, but then it costs more in feed and it costs more in time. So there's an optimization point there, and we help people find their optimization point. Um, so that, you know, that. People are using that, that's quite successful. It's nice to see people using things. And uh, uh, this company that owns a, a large station called Tipperary in the Northern Territory approaches about weed management. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the weeds because we're still getting our heads around it because it's quite complicated, but we are making progress. But this is the outline of their property. You can see it there, it's big, right? You get the idea, it's big. It's actually one and a half million acres. It's about 320,000 hectares. And I only realised how big it was when I started making these slides for this talk because if I, if I step back a bit, you can still see the green outline there in the Google map of Australia. It's really big. In fact, if I go one more, you can still see it there and we can see Singapore up there. It's, <laughs> it's like really, really big. It's really big. And it has 50 people. <laughs> So they've got 50 people to manage that. In fact, if you want to get to, from one end to the other in reasonable time, you have to get a helicopter. So there's, it's, it's an amazing place, but it's big. It's full of nothing. It's full of dust in the dry and mud in the, in the wet. And yet, on that property, there's about 90,000 head of animals at the moment, and it's growing. And they need to run it at a profit. Now, these are just some shots from a helicopter as I was commuting to work one morning. And um, you, can see these, you can see these lines. Do you, do you know what that, they're the tracks the animals walk on, which, you know, big deal. Except when it rains, it rains a metre and a half in a few weeks. And those incredible erosion from those cattle tracks. So you lose your topsoil, you create big furrows. Um, there's all sorts of bad things that emerge from that and also spreads weeds. And the weeds are in, incredible problem because they remove productivity. Animals won't eat them. They take up productive land. So that's, that's part of our problem that we have to deal with. But let me show you some of the things. This is um, Russell who's joined us and we've put some of those walkover way platforms out there to help them. But we're also putting LIDARs on them. Um, they're quite expensive LIDARs. But what we get is a 3D picture of the animal and we can detect the spine on this way bridge as they walk across. And we can actually correlate this image with the amount of back fat on the animal and its weight. And we actually can predict with pretty high accuracy through artificial intelligence and the LIDAR how much animal that, that farm's going to get from that animal. So they can then create more optimization around it. And for our next trick, we'll actually be weighing the animal from that image as well. we'll we can dispense with the weigh bridge completely and go completely with the camera image. And, and that's our direction for moving to remove the cost out of this system and increase the reliability. And, um, and, so, and so firms from Brazil have actually approached us to use this technique to weigh a million animals in Brazil at the moment, which is kind of doing my head in a little bit, but I think we can do it. So the trick is we've got to remove complexity, we've got to remove cost, and we've got to make, we've got to make the whole thing frugal, really robust, it's just got to work. And so the, the final trick is provenance. This is where the animal's been. So smart ear tags are something a lot of people are talking about. This is, uh, all animals have an ear tag to tell, tell them their identity. So we're trying to make a smart one, but we have to make it cheap. So we're working on a project with CSIRO and a company called Ceres Tag. And I don't know why they're blanked out, but that's Ceres Tag and Taggle. And 
Syro building, if you like, the Rolls Royce ear tag, it's, it's kind of the next refinement of that big one you saw in the cattle at the beginning. It's going to have a GPS and solar panels and lots of stuff. But, it, but it's always going to be an expensive item because it just has a lot of technology in it. So we're trying to go the low tech route. We're trying to work out how we could make an ear tag that would last five years to give us hourly data and cost less than $10. Because there's 100 million livestock in Australia, so it's about 26 million cattle, about 75 million sheep. There's over 300 million um, cattle in North South America. And knowing where your animal's been is important. So this is a map of our Lansdowne Research Station, and what we're doing is putting three, actually four towers in. These are low-cost towers, but they're still expensive. They'll be about $1,000 per unit. And we're going to have our poor old cow in the middle with an ear tag, just transmitting a ping, 15 and a half bytes. But we'll use time difference of arrival to triangulate that animal and artificial intelligence routines to refine that down so that we can get not GPS level accuracy, which would be maybe four or five metres, but maybe we'll get 10 metres on these complicated properties. But our tag will cost $10, not 50. And at $10, it's just about affordable. And if we could sell 300 million of them, we could probably get them for $5. And then you could be used throughout the world. And then we'd know where the animal's been, its whole life history. And why is that important? Well, I'll give you some examples. This is some land use data from our um, Wi-Fi enabled cows. This is a single paddock, and this is where a trough was with no water, and this is where you can see the animals were grazing. As soon as we put some water in the trough, where do the animals hang out? They hang out near the water. So we can find all sorts of information from this about pasture utilisation. We can find information about animal health. Uh, I, I won't go through the litany, but there's enormous information you can infer from this. And that was just three days worth of data. So we think that, that this will be the next generation of livestock management, but we have to get the price down to a point. And uh, I won't go through this, but this is, this, we've actually done some experiments at, at different scales too of, of, of uh, properties going from sort of 100 hectare paddocks through to, to um, 25,000 hectare landmass paddocks. So this is more Tipperary scale and that's more the scale of our um, local JCU research property. And um, all of these solve different problems, but if you've got a big property, you just want to know where to go to muster the animals. You know, how, how do you muster animals when you've got a property that big? And you're, if you know where they are, it pays for itself just in the helicopter fuel that you use in mustering. And this will enable really, you know, this industry for an agriculture. So this, this little story here um, talks about a girl and a, a, a mother and a daughter picking up the groceries and they use packaging that's printed with sensors so they can know where the beef was, where it was purchased they can make sure it never was warmed in, anywhere in the supply chain and they know where it's been for, transported from and they'll even know the farm that it's come from. Um, and then it, the story goes on and it says one week later the US Department of Agriculture Food Safety, Safety determines that beef originating from that original packing company was sold to neighbouring stores and was contaminated with E. coli. So all packages can be tracked and traced all the way through that supply chain. This, this story, which was a story about two or three years ago, put together by this company, Harbour Research, is now effectively viable. And there are now people doing this. And um, this is enabling this idea of this fourth industrial revolution in, in agriculture, where cyber physical systems, we can talk back and talk to virtually anything in the supply chain. So farmers are going to increasingly become um, digital farmers. Farmers are going to become digital farmers. They're going to deal with their farm, but they're going to deal with their data. And their data has significant value. If you're a bank and you are loaning money to a farmer to buy feed or fertiliser, if you know how many animals they have or the status of their crop in the field, then you are de-risking your loan. And if you are de-risking it, you can offer it at a lower interest rate. So that producer can actually farm with a lower interest rate. And if your bank won't give it to you, you'll be able to prove the value of what you've got to another bank and get a lower interest rate. So this, this could change the sort of balance between the, the financiers and the farmers, which I think is very important. 
So data farming is a real thing. So if I cl close my work right back to the beginning where I talked about these water quality monitoring buoys and worried about the reef, we are now starting um, with one of our industrial partners to talk about now monitoring cane farms in, in northern Queensland for nitrogen and turbidity and salinity, monitoring bore sites. These are, the, um, these are the rivers that contain the nutrients that flow out into the reef that, that can pollute the reef. We're now looking at identifying the, the individual sources of pollution and giving us a chance then to remediate those sources, whether it's by modifying on-farm behaviour or other approaches. The things I was thinking about in 20, 2003, I guess, are now completely viable and are being talked about as a, a really something to roll out in the next couple of years across North Australia. And that, that's really remarkable. It shows that you know, some wild ideas actually can get to reality eventually. And that the idea, if it's working here, it's going to work anywhere. Um, and just one more thing, so, you know, blockchain. Everyone talks about blockchain now. Singapore's very big in fintech. Um, blockchain in, in certainly in agriculture is coming. Um, this is a, just a map of the beef supply chain in Australia. Um, it's quite dysfunctional. Our farmers get $1.30 per kilo for their beef, which can be sold in parts of China, I know, for $130 a kilo. Um, I, that doesn't seem fair to me. The people in the middle are making a lot of money for not doing much. The blockchain provides a way to understand where things are going um, and, and, and correct that. So in the future, I think we can have much more functional supply chains. So that's great financially. But I think we can combine that with this environmental sensing, the blockchain value chain and the agricultural sensing. In the middle there is a way to have a real triple bottom line win. We can get financial wins we can get environmental wins, and we can also get much greater uh, efficiency for the farming and, product, and, and their production. So we can imp improve profitability for farmers, we can improve profitability for the, the, the whole agricultural supply chain, and we can improve environmental outcomes at the same time. And that, that I think, for me at least, is, is something that I've been working to for a long time, and I, and I hope in the next few years that we'll actually be able to not just demonstrate it, but by focusing on frugal IoT, instantiate it and actually have it real. And that then is, um, that's an idea that I think has worldwide applicability. And that's where I wanted to finish. So thank you very much for your attention tonight.